This is three questions with Dr. Catelyn Tucker and Dr. Katie Novak. I got theme music. Boom, boom. Oh, very Brady Bunch. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about our the new book that you have written together, The Shift to Student-Led. Is it colon or semicolon? Shouldn't it be a semicolon? It's, no, it's a colon. Is it? Okay, yeah. what's, what's, a what's the... What's, if you're if you need to know, a semicolon separates two independent clauses and the shift to student led is not an independent clause. Already learning stuff. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. All right. So so we're gonna get into we're gonna talk a little bit about and congratulations on the book. This is your second book together. We're gonna talk it a little is. bit about this new upcoming book. But we have a bone to pick before we even get into any of this stuff, before we get into this. So one day I am just around and I'm like, you know what? I should introduce Katie and Catelyn together. And then I introduce you two. And then uh, we're like become best friends. And then you all are sending me pictures from like little traveling thing. And now I'm like out of the circle. So <laughs> we remedy this? Like, what is going on? I feel like I feel like I introduced you to, and then I'm like out, like kicked out of the group. What happened here? What's going on? Let's I talk mean, about the, that. Okay, uh, here's that here's did here's happen. The- hey, we're together. We're doing stuff. We're having yeah, fun. Here's here's the the thing, is you <laughs> are such a skilled matchmaker. So I imagine so for matchmaker. a moment that you were a matchmaker and you brought like a couple together. You wouldn't stay in the couple. You wouldn't be yeah. part of a thruple. Yeah. No, it would still be a couple. So, <laughs> but we we have made a match. We have found love, professional right. love and friendship. And there's just not really room for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I get. All right. One day I'll match myself with a friend. I guess I'll have friends that I can go, you know, whatever. That's fine. All right. But I'll say, George, you did a phenomenal job. Because when Katie and I were in Panama, we could not have been more in sync. Girlfriend and I were up early at the gym, working, yeah. drinking wine, planning for the next day. I actually have, uh, I have on my phone a GIF of you two of you. What? I do have a GIF. <laughs> so, you know. I don't, I, okay. I, like, that's, that's actually serious, right? Cause like, My no, so I don't, I didn't make it. I didn't make the GIF and let's, is it GIF or GIF? That's a whole, that's a whole oh, other yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's a GIF. So I have it. So not like the reason I have it is not because I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a GIF of these two. It's yeah. Katie sent it to me and I'm like, oh, look how good of friends we are. Not yeah. only did we take a, like a video, but we actually went extra and made it into a GIF. So you can kind of rub it into George's face. Like you don't like you don't like you actually have to like go to another like site or a program or something like that. Is that the one we're walking? Oh, oh yeah, God. it is the one we're walking. George, time out. You are the father of the innovator's mindset and you asked us to be creators and I was being yeah. a creator. <laughs> All right. I'm just saying. Exactly what he's saying. talking about. I feel, I feel a little left out. That's all I'm just saying. And we're just putting it out there before. So it's like, it's, it's three questions and a grievance. That's the, uh, the name of this. So we got okay. the grievance out. We got the okay. grievance out. All right. I just want to. I, I, you know, we didn't even talk about this off camera. I saved it. I saved this so everyone can see how so I was just kind of kicked you, out of the group. I, I might want to rework this because there's three questions and three is too many. So could we do two? No, questions? no. I feel, I feel, hey, Katie, can I ask you a question? Younger. Like we can't make three work. Katie, can I ask you a question? What is the name of the guy who is in the Beatles and was kicked out? Do you know? There was a fifth Beatle? Exactly. That's how no. I feel. It's I'm the guy <laughs> nobody knows. Oh, you see what oh just my gosh. There? Yeah, exactly. That- Exactly. There's a fifth beatable. There's a there's a third. There's a third. Yeah, I get it. So your yeah. thruple analogy is not working. Well, it's- I, am the, <laughs> I am the third beetle that no one will remember. I feel well, like he needs like a just- want want sound. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. If you wanted to talk about us collectively, you know, like a Brangelina, you could always call us Kate Cat. You know, like uh, <laughs> oh, I accidentally put George Michael. I accidentally put George Michael. All right, all right, okay. 
<laughs> All right, we'll move on. We shall move on. The grievance is there. You two shall. I know I would say, like, let's all deal with it, but I know that's not going to happen. You two will deal with it and let me know if I'm back in the group. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. I could be in one of your gifts, in your gift, <laughs> having fun walking in Panama, just hanging out. All right. Anyways, let's get back to the book, The Shift mm -hmm. to Student Led, which is the shift is going to be the. I think I can't. Well, I just do that noise, you know, because we said we're going to, you know, Shift is actually very close to another word. So just yeah. throwing that out there too. We're not going to say it. We're not going to say it. This mm -hmm. is a family-friendly podcast. So the is. first question I have for you mm -hmm. is, and either of you can, you can both answer this. All I know, you can both answer this. You can answer this separately. All I know is I'm not allowed to answer it because I'm not in the group. I'm just here to like, <laughs> facilitate the group. So, 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 so why did you write this book? And let's actually mention you. you have, this is, is this a follow up? Is this like a sequel to your first book? Why did you write this book? Okay, I'm gonna take the lead on this one because I was the one who texted Katie at an obscene hour on Pacific Standard Time saying, "Hey, I have this idea for a follow up. What do you think?" And Katie was immediately like, "Yes, let's do this." Teachers are so spread thin and overwhelmed, and I think for me. The first book was really about establishing this synergetic kind of relationship between blended learning and universal design for learning. Like, I didn't met anybody who has any issue with the idea of making learning accessible and inclusive and equitable. I think the challenge comes with how do you operationalize that? Like, how do you make it this consistent and effective part of what you do in your lessons and learning experiences? And so I think this is a nice follow-up because it takes these 10 kind of really time-consuming, typically teacher-led, often a little ineffective workflows, and kind of reimagines them from a student-led perspective that's much more sustainable. The idea being like, let's give teachers strategies so that they can kind of spend more time first outside of school on themselves, resting, recharging, connecting with other people in their lives, but also when they're in class, really allowing students to lead the learning and freeing themselves from, you know, whether it's standing at the front of the room, talking at kids or facilitating whole group discussions or grading everything kids touch and really thinking about how do we cultivate these expert learners who are able to share the responsibility of learning with us. And it's not to say teachers can't lead anything it's like let's just not lead everything and katie what would you say i mean i would say that that's exactly where it's at is people are working too hard right now to not have a greater impact on all kids mm. and i think that many of us were just simply our own education and the way that we were trained to be educators very much gave us the responsibility of learning right that like if kids don't learn it is the teacher's responsibility not recognizing that it is like within the relationship that learning really happens, that we want to make sure that every learner can be in a class and that they learn given the pathways that they need. But I don't know what every single student needs. I need them to kind of co-create some of those options with me. And so when we take all of the ownership and all of the responsibility, students don't have to do the cognitive work to be really engaged, to really personalize their learning. And we've talked about this before, George, is that it's not my responsibility to try to like figure out and give every student what they need. It's my responsibility to recognize that one size fits all isn't working and then together say, okay, so what are some other ways that we can do this? Right. And then as a facilitator, I am much more effective because I can really target that feedback and instruction. Yeah, I remember, actually, I remember having that conversation when we used to talk. No. Oh my gosh! I, I have sent to talk. numerous texts. I, I, was used to I miss you, and you're like, "Oh, I'm so busy." <laughs> I just remember now that. that I remember, I know. Yeah, now I know. Like, I remember from. that because I remember, like, I actually remember also when I used to text you and you respond back. But now, like, I guess I got to do you it. You know, like, I was a a never a great we responder. A never a great responder. Uh, <laughs> well, it's actually interesting that you say you're never a great responder because Calvin just told a great story about how you respond very quickly to things. So. <laughs> So maybe oh, yeah, I don't know you're not a great responder to me. Maybe it's that which is the truth. So 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad this all worked. No, you, you too. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm semi joking. Semi joking. I feel it. I feel your pain. I do. I get it. Okay. So here's here. Okay. Here's like one, here's question one B. Cause I, this is not. So two of my favorite movies, Godfather one, okay. Godfather and two. Godfather two. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. My, like two of my favorite movies. Uh -huh. So you can watch Godfather. You got to watch You can watch Godfather two. You can just right. kind of watch it. Right. But like, it, it kind of helps if you, watch godfather one but you don't necessarily need godfather one what where are we like in the in the god in where i don't godfather three is terrible by the way so <laughs> no right? third book for us <laughs> just, right. like, if you if you can pull off the trilogy right that it would be amazing right so god so is it like do you need to read the first book like what's going on there is this not like a godfather? Is this like kind of got to read it? So I would say that we, the content of the first book was like really, really fleshing out mm -hmm. deeply. Like what is universal design for learning? What is blended learning? How do they intersect? And certainly you could read the second book, but our introduction of UDL and blended learning, instead of being a book is a single chapter. And gotcha. so if you really wanted uh, to yeah. better understand those frameworks, because your district was focused on them. Um, the second book is very much like, here are some strategies that you can use to operationalize, as Catlin said, these frameworks, but like really understanding the frameworks is important. So one of the things that is, you know, in Universal Design for Learning, it's very focused on like, what really are your firm goals? What really are your priority standards? How do you create those? There's an assumption in the second book that like you've done the work to understand right. your firm goals. And now here's how you can design your class so that students can build more agency and autonomy as they make the choices they need. So I would say that they certainly pair very well. But if anyone read the second book and felt like, you know, I'm wondering like, what is the evidence base behind all of this? We really decide, you know, we really dive into that in the first book. And just actually putting it out there, Godfather one and Godfather two both won the Oscar for Best Picture. So this is basically these are like the Godfather books mm -hmm. of UDL and blended learning. So yeah. I'm just saying yeah. they could be they could win the book equivalent of the Oscar. That's what that's right. What, right. All right. Okay. So second question. So this book, right? We talked about really getting. <laughs> we talked about our friendship for yeah. quite a bit, and then we talked about the book for a little bit, and so. When we actually look at this, you, you we're talking about how people are super overwhelmed, exhausted. Uh, we've had lots of conversations about really how do you get actually students to kind of figure some of this stuff out on their own? Because I think a lot of times it's all like we, we take on some of the issues, right? Like we actually take on some of the issues where actually you have to have kids walking out of school where they can advocate for themselves, you know, figure some of this stuff out. So what do you actually ultimately, um, if this book in tangible ways and I, that's actually a word i'm really focusing on in tangible ways what do you actually hope this achieves you know like what does this look like you know for for teachers they they embrace this book they embrace the ideas what is that end result of that i think the end result is you have teachers who aren't standing at the front of the room orchestrating learning experiences the entire period whether that is direct instruction with mini lessons, lectures, what have you, whether it's, you know, being the person to facilitate a whole group discussion, whether it's the only person giving feedback, which obviously that happens outside of class. It's like, it's teachers who realize one, our kids are capable. Like the only limitations kids have, I think, are the ones we put on them, right? Like, oh, I don't think they can do that. Well, if you don't think you could, they can do something, you're never going to try it. You're never going to give them the opportunity to, to stumble, to try again, to, you know, iterate and improve. And for me, it's like, I often butt up in trainings and sessions with teachers, with teachers who say, well, but kids won't and well, kids don't. And I'm like, well, how many opportunities have these kids ever been given to drive their learning, to truly share the responsibility of learning with their teachers? Because at the end of the day, we can't make anybody learn anything. We can only provide these opportunities for them to learn. And I think the more we position them in these lessons as active agents who share that responsibility with us, the teachers, then we allow them that time and space to cultivate the skills 
that they need to be those expert learners. But right now we're not even giving them the chance. And quite frankly, it's really hard. I mean, my experience is secondary. So once they get to you in ninth or 10th grade, they've already been conditioned that like my job is to sit here and stare in your general direction. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, helping them to unlearn that was an arduous process. And it would be so nice if teachers read this book, got excited about the workflows. Doesn't mean you have to shift everything all at once. Start with one workflow, like figure it out, what works for you, what works for your kids, and then start to build from there. So we can have these independent, self-directed learners who have confidence in their ability. Katie, what do you think? Deep. Well, well uh, let this me. Like, like, this is like, yeah. I, this Katie, like, why are you not jumping in? I'm like, this is like the. I was waiting for question three. I didn't know if another one was coming to me. So, what I would say is like, so let me give you an example. One of the workflows is moving from teachers communicating about students' progress all the time to students communicating about their progress to their grownups. Right. And so, you know, when I was a teacher, it was very much like a kid is struggling. I better call home. I better send an email. And the report cards came. Right? It was always me. I was facilitating family right. conferences. I was the one who was making the phone calls. And so people go, okay, yeah, that is like, it's, it's kind of heavy having to carry that, that we are the sole communicators of how students are doing. How do we ship that to students? And so in each workflow, we talk about like, you know, the way things are and essentially the research um, about how that is not, you know, ending up with a desired impact. Like we want to be able to absolutely nurture these relationships with kids and their families and their grownups and not like absolutely cut them out like some other people we know who have cut other people out. But anywho, so like, for example, one example that we gave was, you know, for instance, like creating a slide deck, a Google slide deck, where there's a slide for every single week of the year. And each one is shared between uh, students and their grownups. And instead of us having to communicate everything, giving time, let's say every Friday for students to share an update on like, what did they learn this week and what questions do they have? Now the universal design lens is you could provide options like sentence stems, allow them to either type in text, take pictures of their work, or even do video or audio recording. But all your job is as a teacher is to send out an email on Friday and says, as a reminder, all of the Google slides are updated. I hope you have an amazing weekend. And I love being a part of this kind of shared learning with your children. And a lot of people are like, why didn't I even think of that? Like, it's such a solid idea if you want students to reflect at the end of the week. So again, the model of saying that we don't even sometimes consider those things because it's well, that's our responsibility. So we're trying to empower our teachers to say, not only does this like absolutely shift to students, which means you're doing less of that cognitive load, but the value of student self-reflection, self-assessment, being able to communicate, the connection with families, that is huge and it's actually less work. So that is how we treated all of the different workflows. And there's many different strategies between three and six, I think, in every chapter about how to make that workflow work through the lens of blended learning in UDL. Okay, and again, so it's because it's because we know one workflow isn't or one shift or one strategy isn't going to work for everybody. So it's right. all about like, here's a collection, take one, run with it. So, hey, Katie, so this is actually a specific follow up question for you. So, like, yeah. could a kid actually take like a uh, like that, that, that the slide deck that you're talking about and like, for example, like share like a GIF on it, give an update, like, here's what we're doing right now, having fun, like that kind of thing? Right? 100%, like, so like, hey, yeah. Here's where we are having fun without you, like something like that, like that's a gift. Mm -hmm. All right. exactly. I just wondering. That's a that's yeah, a great I idea. Mean, but just think about, in all honesty, though, think about the innovator's mindset, like being reflective, uh, yeah. communicating, being innovate. I was being innovative. Yeah, I don't know if she don't she picked up my joke there. Did she pick it up? I don't Callie? think so. One hundred percent picked it up. I just okay. like just my it. humor just, is so. You just, ignored it like my, you just ignored it like my messages. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, and one, right. wait, one thing I want to say, George, to anybody listening who's like, I wouldn't even know where to start. Another thing that's, <laughs> I think, a little bit of a differentiator with this book, it is packed with 
templates and resources and like scripts. You want kids doing audio or, you know, even email updates to parents. Here's a script for that. You want them to do a glow and grow slide deck at the end of each week or every other week. There's a template for that. So also Katie and I really trying to make an exerted effort to have resources, teachers who buy the book right. and access so that it saves them time. Well, it actually leads beautifully to the follow-up question because we wanted people listening to this. Uh, I don't know if we're giving you a little bit of a preview, but the idea of like, what's like a practical, like something right now that you can pick up that will kind of lead to that. And it's awesome that, you know, cause I think, um, the, the beautiful thing about, you know, providing that stuff, obviously, you know, really knowing your community, you're going to be able to like tweak it. Right. It's not like you have to use it this way. Yeah. This is the, right. But it gives you at least a starting point. Right. And like, let's reference the innovator's mindset. The iteration is so crucial to this stuff. Right. Cause you still got to work to, really kind of know the, the the kids in front of you that you actually serve. So like if you can each give us like a really kind of like, here's, here's something right away that you can use in your classroom. Like what's one thing that you can think of right now? You go Katie, first, I'll yeah. start with you. Oh, you'll start with me. <laughs> yeah. Ah! So, with you. so what I would say is a lot of the time when we have a standard, we say to students, all right, everyone, I'm a, I was an English teacher. All of us are going to learn how to write an effective argument. And one part, an effective argument is, let's say, understanding, um, you know, logos, like actually using um, like logical statistics, research, fact to kind of prove your point. Right. And so then what we do as educators is we spend a ton of time trying to find exemplars to show students what an effective argument looks like, as opposed to saying to them, I'm going to give you time. You're going to go into a bunch of arguments and you're going to really look at them and think about what is the strongest one. And as a group, you're going to come forward with what you believe is an exemplar. Right. So this is the success criteria. This is the standard. You go do the work. And it's a lot of the times we are feeling like we have to be the ones who tell students this is what great work looks like. But we're actually doing the really, really in-depth thinking that students can use to actually learn and differentiate and start to say, you know, that one's not as good as that one. And I thought that one was solid. And so like, that's one of the strategies is instead of giving an exemplar, allowing students to explore, be more resourceful and have them come up with a collection of exemplars that you can go through together in small groups and then say, no, that wouldn't be in a great exemplar because, and, and that's really, really important work. Well, the, the actually, so something I talk about quite a bit and you just model it so beautifully is that idea that sometimes what we deem as the work as an mm -hmm. educator is often us taking learning away from our right. kids, right? So all of those things that you talked about is actually really powerful learning that we sometimes put onto our plate when it's actually beneficial, right? You already understand what a good argument is, but actually like just finding it and just plopping down as it actually is powerful as a kid actually going through that process you know, having those conversations. So like you have to kind of distinguish sometimes I think like, is this work that I'm doing that's crucial to, or is this like learning I'm actually taking away from a kid that actually would be hugely beneficial, even whether it's in the curriculum or not. I always say this, that you can actually go beyond the curriculum. That's the beautiful thing. Right. And, and, and how do you shift some of that stuff? Uh, I remember one of the, the, one of the years someone came out and, and spoke to us, they said something really telling to me. And I've always thought about it, is that why is it at the end of the day, teachers walk out of the school exhausted and the kids have a ton of energy? It should be the opposite, right? And like, mm -hmm. how are you shifting that? So Catelyn, what's, what's one, one suggestion you got for, for all the people listening right now? So I'll say in my work as a teacher, one of the most cumbersome tasks was giving students feedback. Like I knew how important it was, right? Like we can spend all day talking at kids and telling them how to do stuff, but it's like when they actually do the thing where they trip, they fall, they need support, they need guidance in the form of feedback. But it was like, I couldn't figure out how to do this effectively. And so in the book, we offer a strategy for teachers basically pulling feedback into the classroom. And instead of giving feedback on everything, it's like really focusing on actionable, specific feedback that kids can take in instead of like, hey, I've got this stack of literal or digital papers. I'm going to spend all weekend going through them and putting comments on everything, which is actually really hard for students to digest and act on anyway. And then we also try to model some of the UDL principles in like a peer feedback strategy. So like, hey, 
choice boards are great because they give students agency. Why not take that idea and create a peer feedback choice board? You can embed sentence stems. You can give them different options for how they reply to one another instead of saying, hey, everybody has to give feedback this way. And so we're structuring it. We're embedding support. We're giving them agency and meaningful choice so that hopefully feedback from peers becomes this really meaningful aspect of being part of a class community. Um, and we give an example example in the book. And obviously, like you said, it's a, it's just an exemplar. They can copy it, yeah. they can tweak it, they can make it their own, but still it's kind of taking some of these principles and putting them into action into something like feedback where it could be really, really powerful. Cause you have this class of 30, 35 eyes sets that you can get on each other's work if you know how to really engage them in a meaningful way. So here, here's something I'm just going to say to kind of end this all off. I, as much as I joke about connecting you two and you kick me out of the group and stuff like that, when you're just <laughs> listening to the both of you, uh, like when I, I actually knew both of your work very intimately before you knew each other. And I, and I was like, how is this like, this is like a no brainer um, connection. And I, I'm so unbelievably grateful the two of you connected because I honestly truly believe that it actually is making education way better. And you've helped so many people and just your work is so beautifully aligned. And I actually think it, it came at a time, especially like it was like not only that it just it came at a time when people needed it the most, right? Like I just thought that was beautiful. And so just kind of listen to you as much as I joke, like how much I appreciate it's just so cool. And so also all of your success, I do say take like 80% credit for it. Cause I'm like, <laughs> no, that's that's like kind of, that's kind of like the long way yeah. of me just getting credit for something, but no, I'm, I'm kidding. Oh like it's, it's obviously the two of you are, first of all, uh, you cannot find two people who are as knowledgeable in their specific subject areas who are also amazingly passionate about them too. Cause I think one without the other is not as powerful and I just love it. So it is it's actually just awesome to, to see you together and it's just kind of cool. So I'm expecting, I, I'm putting this out there. I'm expecting, I'm expecting, Godfather you to, three. I'm expecting Godfather three. You are the fix for that. Oh so, like, that's a lot of pressure because, like, Godfather yeah. three is like such a letdown. So, I'm like, you, you need to remedy that situation. So, I'm just giving okay. that heads up. So, challenge hey, accepted, <laughs> duly <laughs> noted. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Catelyn and Katie, awesome to see you both. I can't wait to see you in person together some point maybe hopefully yep. on the all right and we'll see we'll see how i get treated there we'll see how it happens there, right? <laughs> all right. yeah just get the messages right i can't be <laughs> wait to be in that no i'm kidding so everyone thanks for listening thank you so much i'm so excited you can get the book now it is actually in the description down below thanks for everyone for listening have a wonderful day